does a company go from being the $125 billion darling of the dot-com boom to little more than a punchline in just a few short years? The story of Yahoo's downfall is littered with hubris, bad design, outsized egos, and almost comically unfortunate missteps. So join us today as we venture back in time to the colorful world of the early internet and examine the rise and fall of Yahoo. Back in the dim and distant days of 1994, Stanford classmates Jerry Yang and David Philo sacked off their important studies to lark around a bit on the newfangled information superhighway. In those days, internet users had to search pretty hard before they happened upon anything worthwhile. So the public-spirited pair decided to do everyone a favor by creating a humble, personally curated directory of their own best-loved websites. This went on to be called Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web. As the number of pages grew, Jerry and David's Guide to the World Wide Web organically developed into what later analysts would classify as a so-called hierarchical structure. What that means is if a user logged on looking for last night's soccer results say they need to click on the sports section, then click football, then click their team before arriving at the all-important results. In this way, the so-called Internet Portal model was born. No longer would pioneering Internet users be forced to trawl through endless slow-loading websites to get at the info they sought. Thanks to Jerry and David's brainchild, swiftly rechristened Yahoo after the crude hicks in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, internet users could enjoy a curated one-stop shop experience under the ambit of one cozy, all-knowing, oracle-like homepage. Yahoo wasn't the only such portal around back then, to be clear. As the team grew over the coming years, it was jokingly claimed internally that the very name Yahoo stood for yet another hierarchically organized oracle. But Yahoo was smarter and moved more quickly than its rivals, going public in 1996 and leaving rivals Lycos, Excite and America Online in the proverbial dust with a 600% increase in share value by the year 1998. During that white-hot early winning streak, the company became the number one portal and search engine on the web, with nearly 1 million daily page views and an astonishing, for the time anyway, 30 million unique users a month. By early 1998, Yahoo had added a suite of services to its core web directory business, including early forays into email, shopping, classified ads, online personals, a precursor to Tinder you might say, celebrity gossip and even a kid-friendly arm called Yahooligans. The homepage was now customizable too. It was all very exciting. Such was the feverish atmosphere that year, Yahoo execs turned away a couple of hopeful tech geeks called Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who had the outrageous cheek to come to Yahoo's office in an effort to flog them a niche search engine called Google for a cool million dollars. Who knows what happened to those guys? Things were on the up and up for Yahoo, and as the new millennium dawned, its share price peaked at an all-time high of $118.75. In that brief shining moment, Yahoo was worth more than Disney, Viacom and News Corp put together. Still, things were about to change. During a binge of acquisitions, the company had shelled out a cool $3.7 billion for novelty website builder GeoCities and $5.7 billion on Mark Cuban's TV streaming service Broadcast.com. And well, it wasn't called the dot-com bubble for nothing. In a few months, Yahoo's stock would be trading at just $8.11 a share. So what went wrong for Yahoo? Looking back, Yahoo can certainly hold its head high as an early pioneer of much of what we take for granted online today. Take LaunchCast, a 2001 startup acquired and nurtured by Yahoo that offered a pioneering freemium model for music, with 1,000 songs a month available for nothing or for just $4 a month at CD quality with no ads and unlimited skips. This almost forgotten so-called Yahoo music service existed almost a decade before Spotify came to dominate the music business. Mark Cuban's Broadcast.com was almost definitely overpriced at $5.7 billion in 1999 money. But the idea of watching TV over the internet really wasn't so ridiculous, but only when everybody got high-speed connections several years later. Yahoo is also recognized within the industry as a pioneer of the pay-per-click advert model that built so many overnight online fortunes. The first such ad, former staffers recall, had the word naked deliberately buried in the ad copy in order to drive engagement. Yahoo was also a pioneer in its promotion of image-sharing platform Flickr, although clearly it was smashed out of the park by Instagram, following what most commentators agree was a lack of visionary investment by Yahoo in the platform. The Flickr situation is worth noting, as it points to a wider malaise within Yahoo. Because with Flickr, as with Yahoo Mail, which of course ultimately gave ground to Gmail, it was in the market first, with a huge audience that it simply squandered. Was poor leadership the problem? Yahoo certainly endured its share of less-than-stellar CEOs. Scott Thompson, for one, sold off tens of billions of dollars worth of the valuable stock founder Jerry Yang had purchased in Chinese Amazon equivalent Alibaba, and laid off some 2,000 workers. 
All this after lying on his resume about having a degree in computer science. Scott Thompson succeeded Carol Bartz in the CEO chair, who herself was forced out in unedifying fashion by a board she colorfully described as doofuses. Still, Terry Semmel, a former Warner Brothers executive, is generally considered the worst boss Yahoo ever had. Not only did he miss the company's second and final opportunity to buy Google, still a snip at $3 billion in 2008, but he also botched potential bottom dollar buyouts of Facebook and DoubleClick, itself the main engine of Google's world-beating revenue model. Semmel's real pièce de résistance, however, was turning down a $40 billion buyout offer from Microsoft in 2008, which valued the company way above what it would soon be worth, even as Google and Facebook mercilessly devoured its user base. So why did Yahoo lag behind? Some argue the engineering culture, which is integral to the DNA of latter-day giants like Google and Facebook, is part of the answer. As massive as Yahoo was, it was never entirely clear what the firm's MO was. This uncertainty came to a head during the unhappy tenure of Yahoo's seventh and final CEO, Marissa Mayer. Marissa Mayer was known as something of a rock star in tech circles. She was a legend at Google, as only the search giant's 20th ever hire, and came to Yahoo with a reputation for customer-focused, data-driven decision-making. Her big pitch to Yahoo when she came on board in 2012 was to work on the core businesses, or mavens as she put it, a mangled acronym standing for mobile, video, native advertising and social. She boldly, too boldly many argued, bought blogging site Tumblr for $1.1 billion and hired American journalist and television hall of fame Katie Couric to front Yahoo's current affairs arm. Still, despite her best efforts, Mayer acquired a reputation for indecisiveness and confusion over strategy. Maybe the problem was bigger than her. The very notion of an internet portal had been drifting out of fashion for a decade, and as such, the revenue streams from that advertising model were no longer viable. The platform was also exposed to a vast hacker attack in 2014 that exposed the details of up to a billion users, still one of the largest data breaches in history. At the end of Marissa Mayer's reign, as the firm was sold to Verizon for less than $5 billion, she wrote to all staff to remind everybody proudly that Yahoo had changed the world. Before Yahoo, the internet was a government research project. Yahoo humanized and popularized the web, email, search, real-time media, and more. Reflecting on Yahoo's precipitous fall from grace, it's interesting to speculate on whether the firm could have absorbed Google, Facebook, and Instagram, and gone on to stand today as an unbeatable online colossus. Or would their anemic management have botched the opportunities and set the growth of online services back several years? In truth, the real reason Yahoo failed probably has more to do with the sheer scale of the internet. That hierarchical model we described at the start of this video is all well and good when there's only a few hundred or a few thousand sites. Google's PageRank algorithm, offered to Yahoo for a measly million bucks back in the 90s, recognized that indexing and storing the sheer volume of online content needs some pretty sophisticated automation, not a couple of goofy Stanford students posting whatever they felt like on a cheesy landing page. And yet, the most valuable thing the company ever did, ultimately, was Jerry Yang's inspired early investment in Alibaba. A stake that, although substantially reduced from its former glory by bad management, spun off from the Verizon deal and is still worth some $30 billion today. What do you think? Was Yahoo's poor management to blame? Or were Google and Facebook more agile in hoovering up the attention of the modern online audience? Let us know what you reckon in the comments.